remember Bobby Richardson. Bobby, I was a Mickey Mantle fan, and other, but Bobby Richardson was just, there was just something special about this guy. He, he, he no flash, no this, no go out, turn the plays, uh, come back in, and then he broke my heart. He retired <laughs> at 30. And uh, I remember him saying and talking about the ministry and got in one of the newspapers that he had, there was something bigger calling for him. At the time, I didn't understand it, that he was being an impact player in my life then because that seed was planted. And now I understand the Bobby Richardson decision, that there's something bigger than the Grand Slam home run. With that, I want to introduce an impact player in my life and one of the best guys you'll ever want to meet, Bobby Richardson. I just want to say a word about the Grand Slam. Uh, I was, that was the third game of the 1960 World Series, and uh, I started walking up to the plate. It was one out, one run in, bases loaded, Whitey Ford up next. And I remembered that Casey Stingle so often in a situation like that would pinch hit for me. He would say simply, hold that gun. That meant come on back and let Enos Slaughter hit for you. He actually pinch hit for me one other time in the first inning. I walked by him and I said, why did you start me if you're going to take me out in the first inning? And he followed me right into the clubhouse. He said, get your little mitt and go down in the dugout uh, in the bullpen and warm up Ryan Duran. That was my punishment that Ryan Duran would be throwing in the dirt. But I didn't hear hold that gun, and so I walked up to home plate, looked down at third base, and Frank Rossetti was giving the signs, and he had me bunting. And I fouled it off. Well, I couldn't believe it, but he put it on the second time. I fouled it off again. And then Frank Rossetti hollered out, hit the ball to right field, try to stay out of the double play. And I was trying to hit a ground ball to the right side when Clem Levine threw the fastball in here. And I was more surprised than anybody when I went out of the park for a grand slam home run. And when I came by Stingle in the dugout, he said, good bunt. <laughs> but, uh, just this one thought about Yogi. He was a wonderful player, outstanding hitter. But then in 1964, we lost four games in a row. You men know that when you lose, there's an air of quietness in the clubhouse and locker room. And after that fourth loss, going out to... O'Hara Airport, Yogi sitting in the front of the bus on the left-hand side, Phil Lynch decided to play this harmonica of his in the back of the bus. He hadn't played an inning of any of those ball games, but he chose this time. Yogi heard it but didn't say anything. He thought, surely this is not happening. About 20 seconds later, he heard it again, and this time Yogi jumped up and said, put that thing in your pocket. He didn't use those words, but something to that effect, and <laughs> Phil was in the back of the bus, and he couldn't hear him. He said, what did he say? And, Mandel was sitting over across the aisle, and he said, he couldn't hear you. Play it again, louder. <laughs> well, he did. And this time, Yogi jumped up, grabbed the harmonica, threw it, and hit Pepitone. He called for the trainer. He fired him $200, fined him $200. And there were seven reporters traveling with us. And they sort of agreed they wouldn't print it. It would look like dissension. But it was headlines in all the newspapers. <laughs> but Yogi got the last laugh. The Yankees came on to win the pennant on the next to the last day of the season. But Phil really got the last laugh. Because of the publicity that came out of it, he signed a contract with a harmonica company for $5,000. <laughs> plus, he was reimbursed. You know, Mickey had a day in New York. They retired his number seven monument in center field. And he had, he had heard me use these words before. And he said, I want to use my words, those words on my day in New York. Too much going on that day. I was there, he was there, but it didn't happen. But on national television, when I had his funeral, that very humbling experience, I was able to share those words. But before I do, I couldn't help but express that it was Pete Maravich, who had a, probably the most humble testimony I think I've ever heard. And Mickey had been listening to his testimony, audio tape. And I think that was the key that prompted his decision to say yes to Christ. Those words were written by a friend of mine, and they'd be good to close with today, and I'll turn it back over to Tom. They start out by saying, your name may not appear down here in this world's Hall of Fame. In fact, you may be so unknown that no one knows your name. The trophies, the honors, the flashbulbs here may pass you by, and neon lights are blue. But if you know and love the Lord, 
then I have news for you. This Hall of Fame is only good as long as time shall be. But keep in mind, God's Hall of Fame is for eternity. This crowd on earth, they soon forget the heroes of the past. They cheer like mad until you fall, and that's how long you last. But in God's Hall of Fame, by just believing in His Son inscribed, you'll find your name. I tell you, friend, I wouldn't trade my name, however small, that's written there beyond the stars in that celestial hall. For every famous name on earth, or glory that they share, I'd rather be an unknown here, have my name up there. And I guess that really does say it all. An abiding relationship, a personal relationship with a living Savior who gives to us an abundant life. Tom, thanks for letting me share.